Welcome back Seahawks to another edition of Seahawks Central News, your source for the latest in local news and entertainment. I'm Anna Phillips. And I'm Maki Suzuki. This week, we take a look at the street artist known as Banksy, as well as an interview with the screenwriters of The Conjuring. We'll also be discussing a motorcyclist attack and progressive laws in prostitution. Stay tuned because Seahawks Central News starts right now. The federal government may be shut down, but some Good Samaritans refuse to be stopped. Here in New Hanover County, weekly losses from the frozen government total $300,000. A plan was laid out by county commissioners to cover the deficit that closed or suspended many programs, including the federally funded child daycare services, social services, and adult daycare services. However, the owners of New Hanover Adult Day Services say they will make it work. Employees have already given up five hours of paid work per week in order to cover some of the costs. Owner Jennifer Riker says that she and her husband will take the rest of the loss. It's really good to hear about these people refusing to be stopped by it and doing what they can for the community. Exactly, especially in a time like this where it's all about people just helping other people out. Mm -hmm. It's easy to forget. This is really affecting a lot of people personally. On October 4th, the local September deaths of two bottlenose dolphins was confirmed to be due to the morbillivirus. virus. One dolphin washed up at the Curie Beach, but died on its way to the veterinarian, while the other was found dead upon the scene of discovery. The virus responsible was identified as the cause by the UNCW Marine Mammal Stranding Program and has killed hundreds of dolphins on the East Coast. In recent events, in addition to the two dead dolphins already tested, another dead dolphin was washed up on Holden Beach and is now being tested for the morbillivirus virus as well. Our reporter Helen Anderson was on hand for the opening of the Test City Art Exhibit in the Cultural Arts Building. Helen? Ever wonder what life was like before digital television? Well, now's your chance at the group exhibition Test City to experience a transition from analog to digital television. I'm here at the Cultural Arts Building where the exhibit's taking place to speak with coordinator Courtney Johnson and performer Juan Jose Grego to find out more. Wilmington was the test city for the transition from analog to digital TV. On September 8, 2008, the first city to go all digital was Wilmington, so that's where I got the inspiration for doing this exhibition. Uh, there's a variety of work, and I wanted to investigate this from as many ways as I could find. So there are drawings that show uh, analog television from 2002 and really cutting edge electronic and sound compositions by Philip Stearns behind me, as well as interactive uh, touch screens by Samson Young. So there's a, there's a wide variety of artwork and ways that the medium of television is being investigated through art. I was, um, for these pieces, uh, using the, um, the idea of the vessel. Sometimes we think of the vessel being like a vase, you know, or some kind of container. So I was thinking of, uh, of the body being the vessel and then the body being connected to the digital. So that's specifically with the belly piece is, uh, is dealing with the body as a digital vessel. After looking at all the art and seeing a great performance by Juan Jose Griego, I felt a click away from digital TV. For Seahawk Central News, Teal TV, I'm Helen Anderson. Back to you. Thanks, Helen. Wilmington's longtime tradition, the annual River Fest, took over the streets of downtown this past weekend, October 4th through the 6th. The festival gathered crowds of people downtown with its usual array of artworks, delicious fried food, live music and activities, and entertainment for those in attendance. Riverfest offered the best of both worlds, with the option for participating in its 8K run at the River Race, balanced by its multitude of street vendors and beer gardens. Among many other highlights were the stand-up paddleboard contest, the comic pro wrestling tournaments, antique car shows, and even a fireworks show held on Saturday night. Last Saturday, the Conjuring screenwriters Chad and Carrie Hayes came to a special screening at Lumina Theater for a Q&A session about their film. Our reporter Kristen Dre has more. Kristen? In July of 2013, the movie ranked the number three best horror film made its debut. The Conjuring has been known to set shivers down viewers' spine worldwide. Today, I'm here with the writers of the film, Chad and Carrie Hayes. Hey guys, it's hey. so nice for y'all to be with us today. Nice to meet you. Happy to be here. So, how is it writing horror films? 
Wow. Yeah. Scary. Scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's fun. We have, a, we have a great time. We enjoy it a lot. Um, you know, our first one was House of Wax, which was more genre. Um, second one was The Reaping, which was more uh, thriller-esque, right? Supernatural. And this one has been kind of labeled as our first wholesome horror movie where, you know, we got lots of great scares, but, you know, there's no sex, there's no yeah. violence, and there's no blood, and there's a happy ending. So um, it's been really enjoyable. I think always the challenge in, in scary movies is to make it different. Yeah. To try to make it different. That's something you haven't seen before. So is there anything that you guys have written when you've kind of thought to yourself, oh, okay, good luck trying to film that? As far as being able to film things, I mean, in this particular movie, you know, when, when James Wan came on board, he's sort of the king of all that. And we got more excited about what he was going to bring to it, you know, like elevate it up more than yeah. not being able to do it, if that makes sense. I think the, the, the challenge and, and the fun of it is when you write it in your little – cube at home you know and you're you, you have it in your head and then to actually be in the movie theater and get people to react from the scare you created in in your own mind is is really rewarding do you see any sequels in your future mm -hmm. yeah we're working on um conjuring 2 right now the script yeah yeah, yep. yeah. hopefully we're gonna start uh, filming it um hopefully as soon as we're done they've we've been working on it for a couple months we're almost done um done with the first draft and we'll get that turned in, and yeah, they want to get going on it immediately. So we're very, ex very excited about that. Another true story. Do you think you're gonna have um, Dr. Pasolka assist you guys in that movie as well? She already has. She already is. And George as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's they, so They've awesome. both been helping us out uh, tremendously. There's, there's a lot of sequences, you know, that are either in Latin or deal with Catholicism. That, and we're not Catholic, so we're not really versed in that area. And um, and yeah, definitely been using them, and it's been a collaborative, fun. I mean, we're all friends now because of the first movie, um, and so it's just more excuses to call each other. I can tell you that your audiences are definitely looking forward to seeing what The Conjuring 2 has to bring. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you. Well, thank you guys so much for You're being welcome. with us today. It was such an honor to be able to sit and discuss some of your um, things with you guys. Thank so, you. Thank you, thank yeah. you very much. I appreciate it. It was nice meeting you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm Kristen Jerry reporting for Seahawks Central News, Teal TV. Thanks. Thanks, Kristen. Pimps and prostitutes are the focus of an act that went into law in North Carolina on October 1st. An assistant to the new Hanover County DA told the Star News that the law does several things. It allows for felony charges against pimps, protects teenagers from prostitution charges and allows for women of age to choose deferred prosecution. That choice allows women to go through counseling and treatment for whatever they may need to get out of prostitution. This option was started in New Hanover County about a year ago and was very successful. Lawmakers hope that these new sanctions will encourage investigators to really get to the bottom of individual pimp and prostitution charges. The Wilmington Bus Shuttle Service is excited to announce their shuttle system is now officially making its rounds to and from the downtown area. The Wilmington Shuttle Service began operating officially on October 4th and runs Friday and Saturday from 6 p.m. to 3 a.m. along the 601 bus route. The Wilmington Bus Shuttle, funded by advertisers and $5 fares, has big plans for the future. It hopes to partner with UNCW for a late-night bus system for students on campus that will be designed to provide safe rides and reduce students' risk of drinking and driving. While October 1st marked the beginning of hardship for many people in our country, one artist is attempting to light up the streets of New York with fun, color, and excitement. Anonymous artist Banksy began his attempt at a month-long show on the streets of New York. Each day, he posts a picture on his Facebook page and Instagram of the graffiti for the day, challenging his followers to find it before the vandals do. Each piece comes with a phone number painted by it, which the viewer can call to listen to commentary on the work. Two bikers have turned themselves in and have been arrested in connection to a motorcycle gang's assault on the driver of an SUV during a scuffle that took place on Sunday, September 29th. Video footage shows Leon, the driver of the SUV, driving with his wife and child in Upper Manhattan when one of the bikers cut him off. This caused Leon to bump the back of the biker's tire. Angered, the bikers responded by a full-on mob chase and ended up dragging Leon from his car and beating him severely. 
Members of both parties sustained injuries that landed them in the hospital. While the bikers pushed to get Lee in charge for injuries he caused to one of them as he tried to escape the scene, the two reported biker assailants, Cruz and Edwards, have been charged with menacing, reckless endangerment and endangering the welfare of a child. A member of the motorcycle club and off-duty officer finally spoke up to his superiors Wednesday, October 2nd after having waited three days to report details of the altercation. A 34-year-old woman is dead after taking police on a high-speed chase last Thursday. Miriam Carey drove her car through a White House checkpoint, ran into a Secret Service officer, and then took off into Washington, D.C. Bouncing over sidewalks and medians, officials eventually cornered the car and fired shots as she tried to speed away once again. Many government offices were on lockdown for part of the afternoon, but the D.C. police chief says that while the incident does not appear to be random, it also does not seem to be an act of terrorism either. Al-Qaeda computer expert and terrorist information goldmine Abu Anas al-Libi was captured over the weekend of October 5th in Libya. He is currently being detained for interrogation by the U.S. military on a ship in the Mediterranean. Libby, seized in an operation led by troops assisted by the FBI and CIA, is said to potentially hold two decades of inside Al-Qaeda information. He is linked to plotting with bin Laden in connection to previous plans to attack United States forces in Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Somalia, as well as in the 1998 bombings of the United States embassies in Nairobi, Kenya, and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. In addition to Libby's part in the terrorist operations, he is also charged with possession of an Al-Qaeda terrorist manual recovered from his residence in Manchester, England. Although officials have not yet confirmed, Libby will soon likely be headed to New York for criminal prosecution. Well, Seahawks, that's all we have time for this episode. Until next time, I'm Anna Phillips. And I'm Maki Suzuki saying so long, Seahawks.